We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Ancara Mess
I really think that my philosophy, again, between brackets, would be very pragmatic and very uh, much based on, uh, on the context that I'm working in. And maybe that sounds a little bit uh, vague, but the, the context that you're working in, the culture, but also the, the quality of your players, um, the environment really determines how you want to approach um, your goal as a coach, which is to make, to make individual players and to make the team better. So, um, for instance, I'm working now with the under-19 of, of Singapore, and I had this experience with the with the Australian team during the World Cup. So the the, the, the approach and the, the 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 way of working would be completely different. So in that sense, the philosophy is also different. So I can't really say within in a couple of sentences what my philosophy would be. Yeah, this is interesting. We've never had this before. So it's. It's the way you coach would change and the end goal changes with the level that you coach. Is that what you're saying? Yes, the level, but also the context. Are you working with a team which is uh, dominating the league or are you working with a team which is struggling and um, um, you try to, to control damage? Uh, I mean, I've been working with the under-19 of Singapore recently in a tournament in Indonesia. We were playing Thailand. And we know Thailand is a powerhouse in Southeast Asia. So we had to have a completely different approach towards that tournament uh, than when I play with the same team in a league in, in Singapore, which is much easier. So the, the, the philosophy of playing completely changes when the context or the environment changes. So, yes... The, the, the context would determine my philosophy. How much do you think, uh, as coaches, that this context piece, you know, we, we again, I, I watched the Manchester City um, Amazon show that last night with Pep. It's like the Pep Guardiola show, you know. It's, yeah. And, and we're almost are mesmerized into thinking that he brings this philosophy wherever he goes. But how much of the top coaches have you seen in your experience that, that they actually bring a different piece of them to every every club. Well, if I look at Van Marwijk, for instance, he he coached me uh, more than twenty years ago, and uh, now recently he was the coach of the of the national team of Australia. So, if I look at him, of course, he developed uh, in those 20, 20 years a lot as a coach, but his his approach to players and his approach to the game hasn't really changed. So he he is also very pragmatic and he, he doesn't bring so much new stuff. He just makes sure that the, 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 the basics of having possession and, and possession of the opponent. He is an example of a coach that uh, has a very clear way of how he wants to play mm. and and throughout the years of course it has changed a bit and and he learned things but the basic the basic philosophy if you want has not really changed that much how did your experience as a professional player shape your ability you know when you say professional dutch player you imagine playing in this this the era divisie this technical technically proficient league how did that shape your your beliefs on the game well, uh, I my professional career was was uh, relatively short. As in, I uh, I was playing for Maastricht, uh, which was playing in the in the in the, in the highest division. I, I couldn't make it to the first team, but I, I did train with the with the first team. Um, those small things that you learn. Um, but also the, 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 the attitude of players and the way players compete with each other, that, that to me, that forms, uh, that forms you as a, as a player and later on as a coach. So the, the desire to become a professional football player and the sacrifices that you make for that, that kind of, that kind of formed me in a way. 
And um, I realized that if I want to bring that same mentality to my players, um, I have to, I have to realize that not all of them have the same, uh, the same burning desire as I did when I had that age. So I, I take it for granted that everyone had the same ambition and, and same mentality as I did when I was that age. But I soon realized, especially here in, in Singapore, that that's not the case. Some, some boys just play because they, 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 they just like to play, and, and, but they don't, have, they don't have the real ambition to become a professional football player. So um, I learned that uh, managing my own expectations with the players is, uh, is something that is very important. So you should not think automatically that they have the same desire and the same ambition that I had when I was their age. Uh, this is this is an interesting topic. I, I sometimes I get some questions on that on on social media from yeah. especially high school coaches in the US, and it's it's viewed as a problem. With well, I have some players who are ultra competitive and want to do this, and I have some players that are playing for fun. And um, what's your advice on on coaches dealing with that? Well, what I learned is that I have to I have to talk to my players and find out what they really want. So, I, 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 as I said, I assumed everyone wanted to become a professional football player and everyone wanted to do everything to do that. But the reality is different. So, you need to get to know your players and, and ask them, if they are 15 or 16, ask them, what, what do you like about football? Or what, what do you, you want to do in the future with football? And then you find out that your best player... Uh, actually says to me, well, I, I'm just enjoying it, but uh, I don't want too much stress and uh, I want to be able to combine it with my studies and actually I want to uh, become a lawyer or whatever. So you assume that they want everything. They want to do everything for football and, and become a professional football player, but it's not the case. So if you know that, if you know that... Um, your expectations of the boys also change. So, I mean, I have respect for a boy who tells me at the age of 15, 16, uh, coach, I, I really enjoy football, but to me, uh, once I finish uh, school and I go to university, I, uh, I probably stop playing football. I mean, that changes, that changes the, the, the attitude that you should have with them. And so get, knowing your players and knowing their ambition is, I think, the, the, the best advice that I could give. Yeah. Yes. Because you make, you make assumptions and they turn out not to be, not to be true at all. I think that's becoming more, pro, more important today, isn't it? With, yes. Because we're assuming that everyone wants to win and everyone wants to be a pro, but that's not necessarily the case. No, 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 it's not. It's not. Let's talk about your your experience in Japan. How did the Japanese culture? How did what did you learn from that? How did that shape you as a coach? For me, I learned the most uh, in Japan because the the the, the culture in Japan is um, is very collectivistic, which means that um, in the society people are not encouraged to stand out. And uh, that, that, that has an enormous reflection in, in football because you see very strong uh, team bonding in Japan. But uh, in terms of players uh, who are taking responsibility or players who try to stand out, that's a completely different story. And uh, along with that comes, for instance, uh, decision making. If you, if you are very, if you are part of a very collectivistic uh, system, then um, one of the pitfalls is that you hide behind the the shield of that collectivism, which means that as an individual you tend not to take, tend not to want to take decisions. 
uh, in the field, for instance. And that is, that is something that I noticed in Japan. Um, uh, European players, Dutch players, would, uh, would take initiative and, and would like to take a chance, make a decision, even if they fail, they try. Whereas in Japan, uh, players tend to be a little bit more careful in, in, uh, in making bold decisions and, and they rather they rather give the ball to someone else than uh, try something out of the box. And that was for me very typical in uh, a typical reflection of Japanese culture in, in the game. Having said that, um, the, the, the work ethic in, in Japan is, is second to none. And uh, I, really, I really admired uh, the youth players for their determination and for their discipline and for their commitment. And that's something that uh, after Japan I haven't seen neither in Japan, uh, neither in Singapore, neither in uh, in Europe. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed watching them during the World Cup. Everyone says, "Well, the Japanese players are so technically good." Did you see that? In their, is their training set up like that in in all areas and their development ages? Yes, um, you know the Japanese. They are prepared to. Repeat, 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 repeat. And in one of your previous uh, podcasts, I heard you uh, asking your guest about enjoyment and having fun in, in a training. Um, I learned that it, it's not, it does not necessarily have to be fun all the time. Sometimes you get your satisfaction not from the fun, but from the development that the players make and I see the Japanese players they are very willing to repeat and to do something again and again and again and again and again until they master it with both feet and that determination and that willingness to invest in yourself and to repeat and to repeat and to repeat is something that uh, European players don't have so the technical skills that the Japanese players have is, I think, for 90% based on the fact that they are prepared to repeat something over and over and over again. And sometimes it can be very dry. Uh, and I do not agree with the coaches that say uh, that you shouldn't do isolated uh, passing drills, for instance, because... I learned from Japan that if you repeat and you do it over and over again, that same passing drill, you, you see that the players master it much better than, 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 uh, than any other players from other countries. So that's something that I learned in Japan. And, and to me, that's, that's crucial because the technique is something that is still underestimated because I hear people talking about a lot of things related to football but then if I look at the game then I see players who can't give a firm pass with the inside of the foot and then I think well first you have to go back to basics and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and after that we can talk about other things that are derivatives from the game but the basic things you should you should master first and that's the technique yeah especially in america robbie you know like we've we've got a a country where even at the development age group 16 17 18 the, the older side of it there you're looking at deficiencies in the game a lot of coaches are saying well can we you know improve this improve that but the players are more wired now that that they find their solace in going to the gym um and lifting a weight mm -hmm. Um, yeah. are, are you saying that the Japanese player then is obviously, uh, yeah, more willing to get on the field and just and hone that technique? Yes, yes. I think that that's a good example because going to the gym, for instance, the fitness is only is only a supporting uh, part of the game. You can go to the gym if you want to go to the gym five six hours a day. It eventually you won't win the game with that. You need to master the ball. You need to be able to keep possession. So you need to know 
where to move, your body angle. You need to know which spin you have to give to the ball, which foot you have to play to. So all those details, to me, are 10 times more important. I mean, of course, depending on the age category that you're working with, than, uh, than going to the gym or other, other related, related football businesses. Mm. Going back to the creative piece, you know, you're saying that the, that the, not the problem, the challenge was getting players to stand out because of the, the collective focus in, in Japan. How did you try and change that or did you try and change that? I did. I did. Uh, you try, of course, during training, you try to encourage the players and you try to give them, um, you try to give them the freedom to try things. And maybe more than, than, than with other players, than with European players, I would, I would encourage the Japanese players to do and try things. And, and I would force them to, uh, to make decisions. So uh, also instead of, of uh, a passing drill from A to B to C to D, I would give them a passing drill in which they have to make decisions themselves. And uh, I think that, that that really works for the players because then then you see that um, although they are brought up in a system which doesn't really encourage uh, creativity that much, that initially they have it. They have that creativity, but it's it's hidden somewhere, and it's not encouraged to uh, to use it. So maybe with a, a Western coach. Um, they feel a little bit more freedom to, uh, to 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 show what they actually have in them in terms of creativity. Yeah. How do you think your pathway has changed your view? Your pathway of working in Asia has changed your views on the game compared to what it would have been if you had have stayed in Holland for your coaching. Oh, that's a difficult question because I'm now in Asia for nine years. And uh, although I had two coaching batches in, uh, in the Netherlands, I never actively coached in, in Europe. So I only started coaching in, uh, in Japan nine years ago. So I don't know how it would have been um, if I would have stayed in the Netherlands. But uh, what I can say is that if you work in a different culture, then you tend to look very critically to your own, your own football culture, so my own Dutch football culture. And one of the things that I learned is that the, the Dutch in general, they used to have a very good name uh, overseas, but one of, the, one of the, the threats that the Dutch coach in general has is that um, he tends to forget that in a different context, a different environment, sometimes the way you work successfully in your home country doesn't necessarily mean that you can use that same method overseas. So the, although we are very well known for our uh, adaptability, in, in, in football, I still see that we are a little bit stubborn in terms of we want to dominate the game, we want to play with wingers, we want to have possession all the time, uh, we want to dictate the rhythm of the game, which uh, which is in some countries not not the standard. In some countries, you rather not have the ball or you try to dominate the game without having the ball, and that's something that uh, that many of the many Dutch coaches don't know how to do. I'm not saying that, that I know how to do it, but uh, I do notice that um, many Dutch coaches have the same way of thinking and that it's difficult for them to, to, to change if they go overseas. Well, this is, a, this is interesting because, you know, I suppose our, our coaching culture in the US is very much divided. So we're thinking if everyone can get on the same page, we can become successful but what i'm hearing there is is sometimes it's not okay to everyone to be on the same page and to be a bit rigid in their approach sometimes it's better to have a, yes. a diverse a, a diversity in your coaching community i think so i think so because uh if you if you if you all if you are all on the same page 
then you miss the information that's on the other page. <laughs> right? So you, you, need, you need people who think differently. You need people who, uh, who swim uh, against the stream. So yes, to a certain extent, everyone needs to have the, 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 the same uh, mindset as in I want to contribute to the, to the progress of, of football in my nation, yes. That should be there, and that's something that I that I really saw in Japan. But um, different people with different opinions, people who, who who worked abroad, who saw different things. That's uh, those are the ones who can actually uh, add value to the to the system. I think. Let's talk about your uh, your experience in Russia with in the World Cup with Australia. You you work with. With Bert van Marwick, you were saying about scouting and providing analysis. He had a very short period of between the, the tournament starting and the preparation. Yes, very very short. I think he uh, he signed his contract maybe um, at the end of January, and um, then he had a FIFA window in March where he uh, he could played two games with the, the team for the first time and then the players got together uh, towards the end of May and then the World Cup would start on the 16th of, uh, of June so yes he had very little time mm. so so working on the scouting side of that how does how did he or how did you guys balance between building a system within a short window within yourselves and then, you know, looking at the opposition and preparing for them? Well, Vamawek has, has, he's very, he knows what he wants with his team. So uh, he knows how to build, how to build on that. So my, my scouting was, um, was, let me say, regardless of how he, uh, how he built, build up his his team i know how he wants to play so i know what kind of things he wants to uh he wants to know about opponents because i i did the same job for him when he was uh, the head coach of saudi arabia so i know exactly what he wants in an analysis and what he doesn't want because as i said earlier he's also very pragmatic he doesn't need too much information he needs some certain uh crucial things uh some crucial information but sometimes you get you get analysis of, of 40 50 pages he, he, he wouldn't even read it if it's 40 or 50 pages he wants he wants my presentation to be in a powerpoint of maybe uh, 15 pages with the crucial information and that's enough for him so um Yes, uh, I was together with John John Medgott, who is a former national player who also played for the Spurs and played for Real Madrid. So the two of us, we were responsible for the for the scouting of uh, of the three teams, the three opponents in the group stage, which were Peru, Denmark, and and France. So in total, before uh, Australia actually played them, John and I saw uh, the three teams together in total 13 times. John also worked before with Van Marwijk, so he also knows exactly what Van Marwijk uh, wants in his analysis. And uh, that's how we worked. And, and again, it, it needs to be very straightforward and very, very simple. Van Marwijk doesn't want uh, an overload of information because eventually the players have to do it and, and they can only transmit a, a certain amount of information to the players. So we've only focused on the crucial things like how does the opponent build up? Uh, how do the front players behave when we build up? Uh, are they organized in the pressure? Where do they press? How do they press? Uh, can we reach our number six? In front of our defense easily or, or does their number 10 follow through all that kind of uh, information that is basically geared towards the way for Marwijk wants to play how much of that as well is geared towards individual players so say you've got France you know are you watching Pogba within France or are you taking 
do you watch him with his season at United and you, do you try to get individual behaviors into the report as well? Also, yes. But the, the, the main focus is on how, how they behave as a team. And of course, everyone kind of knows Pogba. And, and yes, we do have individual uh, information on the players as well. But what Van Marwijk wants in his team talk to his players two days before the game is uh, how does the way the opponent play affect or doesn't affect the way that we actually want to play. So he's not going to adjust his team or his way of playing because of France or because of Denmark or because of the way Peru plays. But he wants to know to which extent can we play our own game against them. And uh, I think that's a good attitude because although Australia was the underdog in, in that group, they still play their own game. And although we were not qualified for the next round, I think Bamawek showed that with a good organization and with a clear game plan, you can, uh, you can deliver even against uh, top teams like France. You kind of touched on it there. It's, it's two days before a game it's presented. You know, how is all the information presented to the players? And then how much time is spent um, for each game or, or each opponent specifically? So uh, it works like this. So John and I have seen the games live. We make our analysis. We put that in a PowerPoint presentation with footage. Um, then we deliver it to uh, the assistant coach, which is Ru Kalmans, one of the assistant coaches. He's responsible for the, the, the presentation about the next opponent. Um, he has seen uh, the opponent as well, but only on, only on video, so not in, not in real life. Uh, so he puts together all his findings and our findings um, and then works together with a video analyst who, uh, who then professionally makes those clips with the drawings and everything. And then uh, we eventually get to a presentation which maybe takes between uh, 12 and 15 minutes. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of footage, a lot of drawings even making use of uh, um, so making use of sports code I think maybe you heard of that uh, yeah. software um, but then a, a professional video analyst makes it makes it a nice presentation and uh, then two days before the game um, first it's discussed with Vermaalwijk and, and all the other staff and then Vermaalwijk says, okay, I want this, I want this clip in it, I want this clip in it, this one I don't need. And then we go through everything and everyone gives his opinion. And then Vermaalwijk eventually decides, okay, this, this and this I want. And then the video analyst makes a nice presentation and then uh, Ruhl Kalmans eventually does the presentation for the players. That's how it works. What, yeah. what, did, what did you enjoy the most about the World Cup? Was it the, the preparation? Was it the training? Was it the games? Or was it just being around the, the atmosphere and the environment? So many things, Gary. So many things I enjoyed. You get to know the players. Uh, the facilities were perfect to train. Uh, you see how Vamawek starts from scratch with his players. So the way he builds up uh, his his well, you can call it tactical periodization, but how does he how does he work in a, such a short period? How does he uh, gets across his his idea? Uh, that was for me fascinating to see. Of course, the the whole experience around the stadium in the in the in the in the hotel where we stayed with the with the players, um, the atmosphere, the, the the attitude of the Australian players so professional and so so humble i was very very pleased and impressed to see how the australian players behave um very very professional and very the atmosphere was very professional yet loose mm. so that 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 combination and that's also something that 
uh, is the, the, the merit of, of the head coach. So I observe him a lot and I see how he behaves towards his staff. I see how he, um, how he uh, presents himself to the players, how he tries to stimulate them and gives them freedom sometimes, uh, how he gives signals to the players. So those are things that you can't, you can't learn in courses or you can't learn from books. That those are things that you can only learn from, from in, 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 real, in, the, in the real life situation. Also the informal gatherings that we have with, with uh, some staff at the end of the day, then we were sitting in a, in a small room, having a drink and eating some nuts and, and some cheese and then watching uh, football on TV. And then the informal uh, conversations that we have and the things that Van Marwijk experienced in the past, that, that, to me was, uh, that to me was priceless. Or even before a training or during a training, when Van Marwijk comes to the site and talks to me and explains uh, the exercise and explains his, his thoughts behind the exercise or he tells me anecdotes from when he was a player or when he was a starting coach. All that information, that's, that's priceless for a coach in development like myself. So too many things to mention actually, Gary, but uh, it was one, one beautiful experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's really interesting because having grown up in the UK, the, the British media portray this World Cup camp as this awful, you're locked away in a room for three, four weeks, 24 hours a day. It's sitting, waiting around. And, and they almost, I think they it might have changed now with the, with the World Cup and the role England had in it. But, it, you know, you paint a different kind of picture. You paint a picture as in this is a, it was a, it was like a holiday camp for a coach and a player. Well, for me, it was because all the information I got, was was priceless but uh, actually the team was staying in a in a in a city called Kazan which is actually a very nice city but we were staying in the in the 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 premises of an ice hockey team so we were not not even staying in a let's say a proper hotel where other people come where you can meet other people so we were completely uh, locked out from the rest of the world so there are a lot of security so you wouldn't meet anyone but the people from the Australian staff or the players so in that sense um, in that sense it was it was boring but um, the facilities were good like top sports facilities the field was only uh, 300 meters uh, distance from the from where the players were staying the field was good and that was more important for the Australians than to live in a, in a fancy uh, hotel and then having to travel 40 minutes to the, to the training field. Because that's what they learned from experience when they had the World Cup four years ago in, uh, in, uh, Bra in Brazil. So in that sense, it was not the, the five-star hotel uh, uh, experience that you would expect mm. for World Cup. But um, the way the Australian players behaved to me was 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 phenomenal because they are so professional, so dedicated, and of course they must have been bored sometimes. But you couldn't you couldn't tell from the way they behaved. They were just doing what they had to do, and they were they were they did it with conviction. And, and the, the training intensity was high and, and the atmosphere was good. So in that sense, I, I, I respect and admire the, the Australian players a lot for their attitude in those circumstances. I suppose as a Dutchman, you, you would then be where I see or have, have read about boredom. You would have read about conflict in, your, in, in the Dutch history of going to yes. tournaments. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that, that's a good question, Gary, because, of course, the, the majority of the, the technical staff was Dutch. And um, I would ask the coach sometimes, I said, uh, in this situation, a Dutch player would have complained or a Dutch player would have, uh, would have caused some, uh, some troubles. And uh, all the staff actually 
the Dutch staff was was surprised by uh, by the professional attitude and the selfless uh, mentality of uh, of the Australian players. So you see that um, that there's a, a big cultural difference as well, um, and very positive, for, very positive for the Australians because indeed in a, in, in in a situation with the Dutch national team. Maybe players would have tried to sneak out of the camp to look for some uh, entertainment or uh, to bring in some people you never know. But the Australians, there was not one minute that that there was friction in the in the Australian camp or that was something something breeding or something. Nothing, nothing. So that that really that really struck me. And that, as I said, uh, day by day, my my admiration for the for the Australian players and their, their professional mentality grew. Which team impressed you most um, on the pitch or away from Australia? You know, who did you look at and were like, wow, that was brilliant up close? Um, I saw six games live and still, still France. Mm. Because, not because they were dominating, but Although they were not dominating the games that I saw, you would still have the feeling that yes, eventually they will they will they will win. And if you have that feeling, then you know that the team is so strong that that they make a very good chance of, of winning the World Cup eventually. And that's of course what happened. But you see them play. Uh, I saw them against Peru. Um, you see them play and, and, and they kind of struggle, but at the same time you feel that there can be one moment and bam, Pogba is there or, or Griezmann is there and then, then, then they will just kill you. Mm-hmm. And w- once you have that feeling with a team, then you know that that team is a, is a favorite to win the World Cup. So although the game wasn't impressing, the game wasn't impressive to me, um, I still felt like, whoa! This they got so much, they got so much quality, and they are so solid that uh, that it's very, very, very difficult to beat them, very difficult to hurt them. So uh, yes, they they impress me. They impress me. Going back to your current role with the the under nineteens at Singapore, is that a tough age between development and winning? Um, it is, it is. However, I think if you play an under nineteen tournament, it's uh, yes, of course, it's a good experience for the boys. But it's about it's about getting a result there. And we went uh, to an AFF tournament in, in Indonesia, and uh, we struggled. We struggled a lot. We lost uh, four out of five games. We traveled actually with a very young and, and, and depleted team. But that age category is um, to me, if you are 19, you should be able to deliver as well. And uh, of course, you think about development and, and making the players better and, and hoping that the, an experience in a tournament like that will contribute to their development. But on the tournament itself, it's about it's about the result, and it's not about uh, giving playing time to players because they can benefit from it in their development. No, then they also have to feel how it is to be exposed to uh, criticism, for instance, if they lose the big numbers. Uh, how it is to uh, to be scolded by a coach, for instance. So. That competitive element of a tournament is also part of development of a player. So yes, uh, it is development, but in a tournament like that, to me, it's also about result. What's the what do you think is the biggest area of growth, or where would you like the biggest area of growth? Because you, you know, you mentioned there on the men- the mental side of of dealing with, I suppose, high level pressure. Um, or is it the technical side, or is it shape, or system, or is it culture? What, what's your biggest focus at the minute? 
Um, I think if you if you compare Singapore with with neighboring countries like Malaysia and, and Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, then um, if you look at the four elements of football, yes, technically the the we are behind. I think many of the boys from other countries they still they still play on the street or they they, they have more time to play out. Whereas in Singapore, the emphasis is a lot on uh, education, so players don't have the time to play out in the street or to play in a park and, and increase their technical level. Um, so that is definitely uh, that is definitely uh, an area of focus. Um, but I also see the the mental aspect. As I said, the in Singapore there's a lot of emphasis on on education. And it takes away a little bit of the, the, the toughness of our players. Uh, they are well educated, but uh, compared to the Thai boys who are very rugged, for instance, uh, boys from Laos, they are, they are sometimes like, like, like boys who, who live on the street, who are streetwise, who can be mean. And those are things that our boys uh, don't have. And that's uh, that's a cultural or societal thing. So in many in many aspects, uh, we are behind. We are behind, and um, so you try to look which aspects on the short term. If you go to a tournament like this on a short term, you can make most of the progress. And uh, in this age category, I think. It has to come from the, the, the tactical aspect. So how can you deal with the, the pressure from the Thai boys? How can you deal with the speed of the Vietnamese boys? So I think on a short term, um, the tactical aspect is the, is the easiest to, to win some ground. Of course, the long term, you're thinking about physical you're talking about uh, improve the individual technique and stuff like that and, and, and try to, to make them mentally stronger. But if, you, if you're purely looking at the result of a, of a tournament, which is happening at that moment, is, is the, the, the tactical aspect that you can do most as a coach, I think. Yeah, that's interesting on that piece of, you know, the hunger that other countries maybe have. And, you know, I think, I think a lot of U.S. coaches would would say that's a problem here. Um, do you think that, you know, we, we always want the facilities as a coach and we want top facilities, but do you think there's a tipping point where where maybe we risk giving kids too much and it maybe makes life a little bit too cushy for them? I think so, yes, for sure. For sure. Um, if you look at Singapore, Singapore is a very wealthy, well-organized and, and uh, uh, very nice country. But you imagine the boys indeed from from uh, poorer countries like Laos or uh, Cambodia, Myanmar. I mean, we've been to those places. You see, there's a lot of poverty compared to Singapore. So you you understand that boys over there have a completely different uh, way of 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 growing up uh, with with less education, with less wealth. And then it's obvious that those boys are more hungry in terms of football and they see football maybe as a way out of, of, of poverty or, or misery. So that, that immediately translates in the way they, they, they mentally approach a game. Uh, and the question is, can you, blame, can you blame your own boys, your Singaporean boys, for not being able to to compete mentally with those with those boys from other countries and i think it's very difficult to blame them because the boys grow up in in a society that that is created not by them but it's created through other people and and those boys just grow up in this society so it's it's difficult to um, to scold the players for something that they are not responsible for. And as much as we want them to be hungry and, and 
full of desire and, and conviction, uh, the reality teaches us that, that boys from, from poorer areas, by nature, have this desire much more than our boys. And that's, 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 one of the, that's one of the big problems that we face when we play countries like that. Yeah, knowing that that's a, that's a, a challenge, can you facilitate any learning in that or change in that through a training camp? Is there a way that you can change it as a coach? You, you mentioned there about, about being scolded. Is that a way to maybe change it? Or does that risk going the other way? Um, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. I learned it. I'm, I'm now in Singapore for four years. In the beginning, I was, I was used, of course, to the to the mentality of the Japanese players who give their everything. And then, uh, in Singapore, it's a little bit different. Uh, and by scolding the players, um, you have to be careful that you don't lose the players, because scolding in the Netherlands, you you can do that to players because then they will try to prove you wrong or they, they will they will they feel triggered to work harder or they, they try to give something back to the coach but in Singapore you have to be you have to be careful with, with scolding because it's not it's not in the culture to do it that way. So that's what I learned throughout the years in, in Singapore. You have to be very careful with the uh, habits that you have from your from your own culture or from other cultures that you worked in. You cannot automatically apply them in, in different cultures. So, um, yes, you can be f- fierce and firm in, in talking to them. But uh, uh, I, learned, I learned to to stop being cynical, for instance. That's something that's a habit that I had. And I'm glad that I got rid of it. But that's one of the things that I learned in Singapore because it doesn't. It doesn't work. It works only against you. So uh, even in the tournament that we recently played, um, yes, when you lose five 0 against Laos, you have to you have to scold them. You have to uh, you have to tell them about their responsibilities and and their lack of conviction and determination, but in such a way that they that you still have the a good relation with your players because otherwise you lose them and then and then the hell is lose of course yeah i mean it's it's so important for coaches but it's so difficult at the same time with the you know with the emotion because i can sit here and be like yeah that's that's great i would like to do that but then as a coach the difficulty is the pressure that you're under um would you awareness is so important at that isn't it yeah that's true but the the player should never be able to see the pressure that you're under. Um, and, and that's, I think, also something that I learned in the World Cup. Um, the way Van Marwijk is, is, is always composed is something that, um, that I really admire and, and I learn from that. I remember when he was a coach uh, of Saudi Arabia and he played uh, one of the crucial games away against Japan and uh, I, I was there I was with the team and um, I watched the first half and then just before half time uh, Saudi Arabia conceded a, a, a penalty kick and um, Japan scored and, and then half time we went, we went into the locker room and um, Van Marwijk asked his staff, was it a penalty or was it not a penalty? Uh, so everyone gave his, his opinion because he wants to know because after the game, when he has the press conference, he needs to know what he has to say. And uh, he is very compo- he was very composed, although it was a, a big game, there were 60,000 people there and they lost eventually 2-1 a very important game in the World Cup qualifiers. But the way he was composed in his, uh, in his uh, post-game press conference uh, was something that, that, uh, that I really admired. And I thought, oh, I, I, I want to be like that. Uh, I want to be, be composed, even if there's a lot of pressure, even if things 
don't work out the way you want them to work out, even if you lose in the last, uh, in the dying minutes of a game, I still want to be composed and I still want to uh, show a positive uh, impression of yourself and of the team to, uh, to the people watching television or journalists or supporters or whoever it is. So that is something that I learned from uh, from from our egg. so the players should never see that you are under that stress of course you feel it but um it was a good lesson for me that in in indonesia when we played the tournament and we, we, we lost uh, against indonesia for instance in front of a crowd of you have to go to the press conference and although the adrenaline is still in your body although you're still angry you're still upset with the, the referee for instance or with your own players or with whoever at the moment that you're sitting there as doing that press conference, you have to be composed and you have to forget all those things because if those things turn you on when you're sitting there, then then people get a, a, a negative impression on you as a, as a person or as a coach. But I learned that from Van Marwijk and then I applied those experiences. Robbie, thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. Loved catching up with you. Yes, thank you very much, Gary, and all the best to you. Thanks so much to Robbie for his time and his insight there. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. He kind of started as he meant to continue there. He started on a, on a big note about the philosophy piece, and that was a, a big one for me and how he changes his philosophy, uh, where he goes and in the context he used. Um, and I thought that was really, really interesting because, again, are we programmed to think that a philosophy is something that we bring and everyone else has to adapt to it? Is it something that you can bring to anywhere or is it something where the starting point is you look at what area you're coming into or what country you're coming into or what age group you're coming into and then you work around that as your starting point? So I think the key takeaways there are obviously adaptability, uh, being open-minded, being patient and not going in there with a sledgehammer uh, and then also being willing to look and learn about the area that you're coming in. So thought that was brilliant. Also loved the piece then about the, you can just hear how much the impact of the World Cup had on him as a coach, um, how much the experience of working with the players and at that level, it's just refreshing to hear um, and really inspiring to hear that whenever you can get exposed to that level, how much growth there is for a coach. So hopefully that's yeah a little bit of inspiration for us all to, to shoot for experiences rather than shoot for wins. Um, it's not the wins, it's the experience. I, I find when you talk to these people, that's the real growth. Um, so that was brilliant. So yeah, that was great. Really enjoyed that with Robbie and I hope you did as well. As always, would love to hear your thoughts. Would love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, what stood out for you? What did you enjoy? Uh, what did you agree with? Was there something you disagreed with? Let me know on Twitter at Gary Kernin, Instagram at Gary Kernin. If you want to shoot me an email, Gary at Modern Soccer Coach. Com. So always, always, always thank you so much for your support. Um, if you're looking for sessions or ideas, please go to modernsoccercoach.com slash shop. Um, got the pressing book in there, have the session plans book in there. Got some new stuff coming at the end of the year as well. Uh, so keep on the lookout for that. Um, and before you shoot off today, uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving it a rating on the iTunes page um, and then just spreading the word of the podcast. Always, always, always appreciate you listening and uh, look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks so much. Have a good week. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, Head on over to Coach Kernin on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.